All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mac and Sloan here from Streamline. I know this is a weird day. Here we are having this virtual um, presentation for you, but um, Sloan and I, Sloan's here. Say hi, Sloan. Hey, everybody. We're good all... to not see you. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it's, it is a challenging space, but we took some time to create what we thought would be a really useful presentation for you about guerrilla marketing for districts. And this is a fun talk for us. And we had a lot of fun putting this together because it's so important, especially in times like these, to be able to get your message out there. So Sloan and I are just very, very excited to bring this to you today. A Little bit about us. Um, my name is Mac and I'm very much committed to communication and empowering special districts to be able to communicate. Um, I have background in newspaper, um, background in website development, and also as a small business and local infrastructure advocate. Yeah, and Mac is also the CEO of Digital Deployment, which is our parent company. And then we co-founded Streamline together back in 2015. And part of the reason Mac and I are so interested in these topics in particular is because we do both have journalism backgrounds. And we have some marketing experience and um, we've got some very old pictures of Mac as a very young child doing his own little marketing and branding stuff. So we've got backgrounds in this area and um, I have a background in fire. So of course, when I couldn't do firefighting anymore during, due to an injury, um, we talked about who could we build products for and the special districts came to mind and we've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm. And this is Sloan with her dad at the Michael Delorto station in McCallamy Hill. Oh, so, yeah, my dad's been a volunteer firefighter for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. So Sloan has lived experience as a special district, which just is so <laughs> helpful for this talk. <laughs> yeah, and, and this topic in particular, so just, this is not a sales pitch, but what we build is we build communication and collaboration tools for special districts. It doesn't really have a lot to do with guerrilla marketing. We're not gonna talk about the things we do at all today, but this topic matters so much because districts do really important work, but people don't know who you are unless they're mad at you, right? Um, often what I see, and we're in California, um, but I imagine it's pretty similar across the United States. What I see is that people don't even understand who special districts are until some kind of bad press happens or something like that. And then everybody is up in arms about these taxing entities, right? That they're suddenly very upset about when they don't even understand that the citizenry created them in the first place, right? So we really were passionate about this topic. Yeah. And what's so important is that you get to tell your story, not that your story gets told for you and that your messaging really reaches others. And if you're not signed up for or attending our other talk about how to tell your story, that's coming later um, in On the- On Friday, Friday morning. Friday morning, yep. So uh, anyway, there'll be lots here and we will send out and some of the bonus materials or have available um, John Oliver's um, special districts reporting. And this you know, became widely popular on social media because it's funny because it's John Oliver, but it just, again, it, it goes to show like how many ways information gets out there and how you're being more creative and leveraging really low cost means of getting your marketing out there can make a big difference. Yeah. Just a few facts um, about, you know, online attention. Mm -hmm. Most people under 30 prefer to read on screens. Um, many people that are over 30 definitely do not. In fact, they, they find it difficult to do anything other than scan. And one thing that I really want to point out is that with the majority of your, um, you know, of the people that follow you online, many just will they don't really read online in the same depth. They sort of skim. So they're reading like headings and bullets. So that's very important to know. The online attention span is only about eight seconds. Users usually read about 20% of text on a page and 59% of people will share an article without even reading it. We do have <laughs> some funny examples of that. Yeah. This is my favorite slide. So um, it's just kind of funny. This is a little bit tongue in cheek, but you can just go through this fairly quickly, Mac. This is just pointing to 
this urban legend, which we've always thought the goldfish had this super short attention span. And apparently people who study goldfish are very offended by that because they don't actually have a super short attention span. So we have now beat the goldfish. <laughs> Yeah, and this is probably stating the obvious at this point, right? But if you aren't telling your story and other people are telling a story about you, then of course, you're not getting the message out. And so it's really important that you learn how to do that. So here's the problem. People don't actually read. We just looked at those statistics, especially online. They skim, they scan for content. They don't read in depth most of the time. So, my guess is a lot of you would say yes if you were in the room with me right now. Um, when I give this talk at live, people are going to actually resonate with this story. So here's the deal. You have something coming up on your agenda and you know that it's going to be controversial, whether you're building a new building or taking over some land or maybe you're, you know, it's an annexation project or something like that, but you know your community and this is going to be, there's going to be people on both sides. And so you do all the right things. You post a notice on your website. You put a notice in the local paper and you pay for it. You send email and stamina out to get the word out about this big project that you're taking on. And so then the meeting date comes, nobody shows up to protest. Nobody shows up to really support it either. It's just crickets. So you breathe a sigh of relief, you get through the meeting and the vote is over and everybody's like, oh, good, now we can move on. And then, this guy shows up three weeks later and he's so angry because you didn't tell him that you were going to do this big project and how could you dare do this without informing the public and on and on and on and on. So I think everybody who's been in special districts for a while has experienced this. And so this is one of the reasons we really feel so strongly about helping you learn how to get the word out inexpensively. And that's why we're here. That is the why behind the talk. So you have your, you know, you have your story, your angle out there and the community knows about you and what you're up to. So we're going to cover that three ways today. First, we're going to talk about guerrilla marketing. You know, what is it? How did it come to be? Um, second, we're going to show some examples of out of the box ideas um, to get the public to pay attention. These are examples that have captured public interest and can be used by special districts um, to talk about the important work that your district is doing. And then finally, um, we're going to talk about spreading the word. So, you know, beyond just the most guerrilla aspects that are out of the box, like what are some sort of industry standard best practices for leveraging your website, leveraging social media and the local paper to engage your community. So first let's talk about uh, guerrilla marketing. So hint, it's not the same as guerrilla marketing, which might involve <laughs> glue or tape or something like that. Uh, from Wikipedia, basically this comes from the term like guerrilla warfare, which was sort of unconventional tactics, like a little bit less organized, less expensive, scrappier, small tactical strategies. And um, it's basically focused on surprising um, the market, creating a greater impression and getting the buzz and getting the word out without having to buy billboards or use more conventional means. And, you know, this is resonating a lot right now because you're really being encouraged to do more with less and, and be more creative. It's, it's not a good look, you know, in a time uh, of COVID and, and other things to be buying massive billboards to talk about how you are using money so efficiently, for example. I know nonprofits, like it's very inexpensive to buy conventional media right now, but it, it can be a little bit of a brand problem. I know nonprofits and charities struggle with this too. They're trying to take advantage of new, mess, new uh, you know, channels to get their, their messaging out, but it's, it can sometimes land wrong with the public. Cause they're like, wait, that's my money. To, yeah, one of the things to point out too on this slide is technically guerrilla marketing is scrappy, inexpensive, but you're also trying to get an emotional reaction out of people. You, you want whatever your message is to be memorable. You want them to hold on to it. And so we're going to talk about that a lot more in the storytelling talk on Friday. In fact, we kind of wish that these were reversed, but um, hopefully you can come, you can watch that talk too, because um, there's some really great methods of doing this so that people remember you. Yeah. And you know, there's a great, statement um, by Maya Angelou that says that, you know, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, 
but people will never forget how you made them feel. So the public may only interact with you in a few moments, and maybe it's you know paying a bill or learning about a rate increase. And those moments are so important. And the more you feel like a familiar presence, not a, um, not a foreign presence is so important because you don't want, you know, taxation without representation sort of feelings from your community. You wanna remind the community why they put you there in the first place. And so it's, it's just really, really important to make sure that those interactions are, are warm. And uh, so we're gonna be talking about some ideas of how you can, you know, put smiles on their faces and have them think of you fondly and, and know who you are, as opposed to being like a new, a rate increase from whom? That's not what you want. Yeah, and, and this slide is in here because so often when I talk to people about marketing in the special district space, I hear things like, well, we're not a company, we don't have competition. Why do we need to market ourselves? Why do we need to talk about ourselves? We're just busy doing our work, which is admirable in so many ways, but we're gonna talk about some of the reasons marketing should matter to you. So, you know, Mac just mentioned this. What if you need to do any of these things? I'm not gonna read off this slide, everybody can read. Um, but, you know, if you've got something coming up again that you want to be able to tell your side of the story, the last thing you need is the story being all over social media by everyone but you, so that you can't officially give anybody information about what's happening. So now we're gonna go into this, this is some of the fun part. We are gonna look at some more traditional stuff as well, but this is kind of fun. Some of our out of the box ideas. So again, with attention spans at an all time low, this is more important than ever. People aren't looking for something to fill their time right now. With the rise of social media, people wanna be able to tell others about interesting things. So you wanna make it interesting. You want to make it shareable, of course, because the more other people share, the less heavy lifting you have to do because you've got other people doing your marketing for you. And then the third one, of course, is make it engaging. If it's not engaging, if there's no way for them to see themselves in the story, if there's no way for them to take part in it, and which of course is much more difficult now in this time of um, physical distancing and all of that sort of stuff right now, but the more that they can take part in it, the better because um, people love to share things about themselves and about their kids, you know, and about their communities and things like that. So we're going to look at some of the fun, fun examples that um, we've seen uh, districts and small towns take on. Um, actually in Sacramento here, they do a chalk event like this too every year. And again, some of this is a little more difficult to do right now, but this isn't going to go on forever, this whole situation that we're in. So this is a really fun one. Um, we have seen this done many times in many different locations where people get a little patch of sidewalk or street that's blocked off and you know they're going to be vendors or whatever you want to do, however big you want to make the event. But you can even think about this in small ways. I've talked to uh, park and recreation districts who've had children drawing murals on the chalk outside of the parks to get people to come into the parks for different events and things like that. So lots of fun. Um, this is something I like to bring up because this is a project that anyone can take part in. Um, it is, I think if you go to the next slide, Mac, you can see the URL. It's, it's the Before I Die project. And what you do is you do blackboard chalk paint all over a wall or something like that. And then you leave these blanks, Before I Die, I Want To. And it's really, really inspiring. And it's something, you know, that doesn't take too much time, a little bit of money to buy the paint and a little bit of getting the word out. And uh, people really love to engage with it. It's, it's a really neat project. Um, I like this idea just because reverse graffiti is really neat. You just make stencils and then you uh, spray them out with water to, or a cleaning agent and so you're actually cleaning the cement instead of doing typical graffiti so kind of fun this is making me hungry so hopefully my stomach won't start growling so community mural projects so you know yes you can go hire a mural painter and um in sacramento we actually have had some amazing mural events there's a, this mural of um, johnny cash downtown that i should have put a picture in it's the most amazing thing ever I don't understand that kind of talent. But you can also just 
have someone draw a stencil out or draw out a pattern and have your community's children and families come take part and, and paint murals on some of the sides of your buildings that could beautify the area, brighten it up a little bit and get the community involved too. So events, um, just coming from a fire background, one of my favorite times of year, every single year, it was a small town, when the third graders would walk down from the school to our fire station and we would host them and we would have them do bucket brigades and they got to run the sirens and, and shoot, spray water and learn, of course, about fire extinguishers and all this different stuff. So much fun, um, really, really good, but anybody can put on great events. I have seen some amazing events at sanitary districts or wastewater districts where they do tours and educational tours for children, for adults, um, anything like that. And again, some of these things we're talking about right now are a lot more difficult to do in the current situation, but keep them in mind for the future. If you start planning now, you might be able to put on some really great events next year. So my favorite topic, flash mobs. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Community service districts and others can leverage, you know, just a handful of volunteers to raise awareness and um, participate in a flash mob. And so, you know, even something as simple as just branded t-shirts or whatever else can really be. Get in the party. Con Zumba. Yeah. Zumba. So we see there, even in that case, um, you know, people, while it started with, you know, a handful of volunteers, it evolved into random members of the public joining in and having fun. So yeah, and there's no better way to get people to like you than to get them dancing. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's just, it's a lot of fun. So now we're going to talk about spreading the word, which is our third topic today. So what are some of the best practices using social media, local newspaper, and beyond uh, that you can use to get your word out? So first, we're going to talk about your website. And so your website is your voice, and you need to make sure that it is being found by the public. So one topic that you may have heard of before, you may not, is called SEO, or Search Engine Optimization. And so what search engine optimization is, is it is the process of making sure that you rank highly in Google or other search engines for the terms that apply to your organization. So if I'm looking for events in my area, Sacramento, if my community service district is on the ball, um, I will see their results, you know, on page one or two. Now, if they're buried on page 10, they might as well not have events because I'm never going to learn about them through my online searches. Same with uh, controversial issues or other things like you want to make sure that you're ranking well. And we have a whole nother talk on that. Um, we can provide linked resources or other things, but it is really important. And so there, um, you want to make sure that you, that you always use your website as the authority. So even if you're using social media, share that press release from your website. 
constantly be pointing back to your website to help build those inbound links to make sure that your website is found. Um, it is so important to make sure that your website's, um, that it ranks well, that it's also accessible. And, yeah, and also keep in mind too, think about the way visitors are searching for information. So you might use your acronym once in a while, but don't always only use your acronym. Spell out the name of your district also. Mm -hmm. Include the town or city name that you're near or the county that you're in in some of your content. Because again, people may not know who you are, so they might be searching for sewer service in you know, whatever county. So just be thinking about the way your visitors will look for you versus the way you would knowing what you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, using terms like things to do as opposed to scheduled recreational events. Like those are things that are helpful for your ranking. And there's some free things that you can do too. So you can um, submit your site to search engines. You can, um, if you have an XML sitemap, which um, is pretty much a standard feature on most modern websites. Uh, most people don't know to turn them on and submit them, but that makes sure that the search engines will quickly find new content that you've posted. So uh, just a couple of stats, high level for websites, and I found this really interesting. Um, you only have about eight seconds. If people do not find what they're looking for, they're gone. So you just don't get much more time than that. Um, five times more people will read the headline than the body content. So again, it's scanning, it's not reading. So you do need to create your website in a way that allows people to quickly locate the information. And people do read only about 20% of the text. So you need to get that information very, very succinctly in there. <laughs> and this is my favorite slide. So if you didn't know, this stands for too long, didn't read. And it's internet slang just to say that something is being ignored strictly because of its length. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, one of the interesting things is this was actually added to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary in 2018 as an actual entry. <laughs> Fun facts. So some tips, like if you're going to make that long content easy to consume, make sure that you're not using more than 15, 10 to 15 words per line. So don't have a paragraph that goes across the entire page. I'm you know, it's, it, I'm amazed how much I still see this. Uh, it's very, very important. And if it is wide, you know, make the text large. But this is why newspapers print things in columns. It's much easier to read. Uh, make sure to break it up with headings, icons, quotes. And scrolling is no longer taboo. There was a time when people really wanted to get their websites above the fold. But then the introduction of mobile devices changed this thinking and changed the paradigm where now it's okay to scroll. But um, there's a statistic, there's still 5% of people who just won't scroll. So here's just a few examples. So, um, you know, here's some long content that maybe is a little dry and um, <laughs> which is a terrible thing to say in wildfire season about a, a, <laughs> a, fire, a fire district. But what we did here is kind of broke up the fire prevention training, ambulance services, safety training. These actually link to pages with more information um, deeper in, but we kind of break them out by adding icons and big headings. So you may not even read, and maybe you didn't even notice that um, this is just lorem ipsum text because you said, oh, look, it's fire training, <laughs> ambulance service, safety training. All right. Right. And, you know, this isn't necessarily a suggestion that you would use icons and headings and everything else to break stuff up. I just wanted to give a couple of examples because people scan for what they're looking for. So there's a quick look through the page and they might be looking at icons. They might be looking at headings. And then once they find what they're looking for, then there's the 20 percent skimming. Right. So they're still just going to skim through the content. And then on the right, just from our journalism background, I wanted to include um, an example of some of the ways you can break up content if you do have long form content. This is an example out of Comstock's magazine here in Sacramento. They do a great job. They write some really long articles. So they break them up with what they call pull quotes or with a little factoid or something like that. So that's another thing you can do to kind of draw attention to different parts of a story. And another thing that we have uh, great uh, success with is also bringing calls to action 
up in the page. So again, this could be a long informational page. It's really wide, but here we have contact us. We're like pulling the action, not from the bottom of the content, but we're bringing it up to the side. That again, keeps us within the 10 to 15 um, word length per line. And it keeps this again, very easy to consume. And it allows people to find things different way. If they want to use the primary navigation up at the top, they can, they use it on the left. So this again is just website best practices. Yeah, and there's so many, I mean, any of these topics could take an hour if we wanted to go into real depth, but we're, we're just trying to kind of give you a quick little intro to different tips that'll help. Obviously, email is not something new, but um, one of the things that I just really like about this topic is that there are ways to make people actually read your emails. I've got some other talks that go into this in a lot more depth and um, looking at the, when I gave this talk live, I said, okay, so some percentage of people don't clear out their inbox even weekly and, and will just ignore emails quite a bit. Anybody in the room like that? And of course, you know, you get a show of hands <laughs> like this, right? So the next slide's got some tips on some of the things that you can do because if you write a good subject line, let's go to the next slide, Mac. If you write a good subject line, it's much more likely that people are going to actually open the email. And if you can't get them to even open the email, then of course they're not going to read it and they're not going to get the message. So um, I'm not going to read through all of these, but one of the things we always talk about in our writing talks and things like that is, you know, good writing is rewriting, you know, editing, tightening things up. Every time I write something, I come back to it later or Mac will take a look at it and you start pulling out unnecessary words and just getting it nice and tight and focused. Um, that last bullet, please, please don't start a sentence in the subject line and then finish it in the body or <laughs> put the entire subject of the email in the subject line and no body text, right? If you want people to read it, you want to write to them in a way that they're going to pay attention to. Another thing, making them easy to parse. So this is just an example. If I'm asking somebody to sponsor my event, one of the things that I can do is make the facts just real fast, right? They're in a bulleted list right there. Here's how much it costs. Look, we even still have your banner from last year. If you want to just reply to this email, I'm going to make it really easy for you, right? So there's one example. Here's another example. Break it up with headings, right? Here's the date, time, and location. Here's the sponsorship information. But in both cases, I kind of lead in with why they might want to sponsor. Twice as many attendees as, as the previous years, and we hope you'll be a sponsor again, right? So just this is easy for me to just go through quickly. All right, so now social media. We're going to talk about how you get the word out on social media. But first, I uh, want to take a look at some larger statistics. So every day on social media, 3.5 billion people participate, which is approximately 45% of the population. That is staggering and continues to grow every year. Uh, Facebook is the current market leader. So um, used by roughly two thirds of US adults. Um, and it's interesting, like Instagram is more popular with the younger age groups as well as Snapchat. And so uh, this I always love to, to sort of look at for understanding. So while Facebook is very popular, um, there is some Facebook fatigue. People aren't spending necessarily as much time, but it is sort of the professional and working age uh, folks um, do mostly use that. Um, LinkedIn isn't actually on here, but that's another really big one. Um, people don't consistently spend a lot of time on it, but they do. They are focused when they're on it because they use it for jobs. So it's not included here, but in terms of reaching the public, um, you know, the big three that I think are probably the most important are Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, Snapchat is very informal, so it's not necessarily like a way that's not really an expected way that you need to reach um, folks. But, you know, if you are considering uh, getting into social media, I think the two easiest ones to get started are Facebook and Twitter. And, um, of course, very very popular. And so anyway, you can see this sort of evolving over time. We do see Instagram continuing to grow. And Twitter has now become sort of like an official communications platform. So while people don't necessarily, like the public doesn't spend as much time kind of hanging out there, um, it is an, an expected form of communication. Anything else on there yeah, to add? Yeah, well, I was just going to say one of the things that we typically tell people too is 
if your district isn't currently using social media, then dive in one platform at a time. Like don't try to take on all three or four or five or what have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, if you don't know what to post or what to do, it, it never hurts to start. Like there's, there's nothing you can, you can just start with your official press releases and just reposting them with a short summary onto Facebook. Like that would be a perfectly appropriate way to start building a basic following, start to get your information out there. Then as you get more creative, you can spice things up and we are going to show you some fun examples of that. Yeah. And, and it's just like we talked about before, like Mac mentioned, put the main content on your website. Mm -hmm. Then go share it briefly on social and drive back to your website because once people get used to coming back to your website, that's where they'll understand, mm -hmm. you know, all of the information about your district can be found. Yeah. And, you know, it's important to note. some people point out in presentations that, you know, sometimes when you include links back to other websites, it doesn't always help your content get as many eyeballs because outbound links like are just a little less popular because the platforms do want to keep you um, focused in their environment. But um, it's okay because the engagement that you get from those are better. You can get more clicks. You can get people getting onto your website, um, learning your story, et cetera. So I think that's, it's just fine to start by sharing your existing content. And uh, some tips, I mean, keep it brief. So really succinct headlines are important. And this is also true of your website itself. So if you have a nice, um, fit the introduction, but then you have really long, tedious content on your website, you're not going to get as much engagement as if you keep it brief, keep it short, and you follow the best practices we talked about earlier. Also, um, being clear on your intention. Is this brand recognition, just general information? Or is are you driving a specific action? Do you want people to get out or, or you know, interact differently with the district, um, you know, be fire safe, etc.? Uh, that it's all very, very important. So being clear, you know, being clear, why am I sharing this? What's the action we're driving? Um, are we just having fun or are we really trying to change behavior? So important to understand that. So also let's talk about what makes the content shareable. Well, first you have to have an audience to share it. Um, if you, you know, you just can't get that information out there if there's nobody following you. And of course, that takes time. Um, there are definitely flywheel effects when you are building a social media presence. So if you've been doing it for a few months and you have 25 people, that is not at all a failure or a problem. You just keep going and year over year, it will just continue to accumulate. Um, content that's interesting, or especially if it highlights local people, I mean, you can tag those people in that content or if it uses humor. Uh, man, when you talk about people in your community, you will get a natural following. You'll get a loyal base. Um, if you yeah, and, and they'll want to reshare it, right? Because they'll want their friends to see it. And so the more you can make it personal and really tell the story again, have the storytelling stuff in my head, tell the story of your district's connection to the people that it serves in some personal way. Yes. And having that content also available on your website, using non-social cha channels, even like if you have an emailing email list and you put it out there to help people um, find it, that all helps. Yeah. So we've got some really fun examples here. And in this one, what's the intention? I, this made me laugh. Um, it took me a minute to get it. And then I realized, oh my gosh, this must be like parking in San Francisco, you know, <laughs> where you just, you know, you're going to get a ticket. So here, just have one. But you know, this kind of brand recognition information, um, informational, definitely, because then people are like, oh, okay, they do ticket here. Mm -hmm. But but again, brand recognition matters, and it matters for your district, just like it matters for a business or anyone else. Mm -hmm. And this is a great way to be funny. Like, obviously, they fulfill a difficult purpose. Like, people don't <laughs> love that, but it's important. And so by sharing it in a way that makes people laugh, it, it humanizes the organization, which allows people to be far more patient and understanding. And this reached over, I mean, probably reached way over 20,000 people, but had at least 6,000 likes. And so that's really, really impressive. Yeah, so again, a little bit of humor, right? But also informational. And, and so their goal, probably with this, is just to get likes and shares, you know, and engagement and comments on, on the post. So I love these kinds of examples because um, 
of course, what better thing to share on social media than your volunteers or your firefighters or the people that are serving your district, right? And of course, then they're proud of it. And again, resharing mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your local paper. Um, obviously, this is pretty old school. This wouldn't, wouldn't normally fall under the umbrella of a guerrilla marketing conversation. But I wanted to include it because it still is so important. If you're in a community of, you know, older than 30 year olds, there are a lot of people who are reading newspapers. Really interesting to me that 58% still say they are primar primarily print oriented. So a lot of people actually read both, um, but not everybody. And um, not, so, not so surprised five times more likely for adults 65 and older. So that's something to keep in mind if you do have an older population that you serve. Newspapers are still a great way to get a hold of them and outreach. Um, I was interested in the adults 18 to 34, they're kind of like equally willing to go print or digital, which surprised me. I expected the digital to be a lot higher. Um, the thing that's interesting about this you're kind of writing online content whether you realize it or not because if if it's going to go into a newspaper it's also probably going to get put on the newspaper's website right and so that other percentage of people who are reading it digitally are going to be consuming it digitally right yeah and i think these are all intertwined too many times the things that get sort of reshared on social media start as a newspaper article then get turned into a, like a meme or a small graphic and then that gets reshared so it is important to kind of help frame the source information that ends up propagating through social media yeah yeah so interesting um there are a lot of different ways to write content for newspapers obviously um there's opinion piece is going to feel very different than a factual press release that is much more straightforward. Back again, what is your intention? What is your intention? Do you want to convince them of something? Do you want to just educate them about something? Do you simply want them to feel warm and fuzzy about what you're doing and who you are for the community? So kind of having that in your mind. And outlines are super helpful just for writing in general. Have an outline and have an angle. So, you know, um, we're gonna, we're gonna look at some fun examples. Um, actually, I take that back because I think I put those all in the storytelling one. You have to come to our storytelling talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the ideal length of a press release, a typical press release is 300 to 400 words. So again, quotes are great. Anything you can do to make it more personal. Um, even though press releases typically are fairly formal, you know, everybody's used to those like, for immediate release in all caps and everything else. Um, everybody likes human stories way better than they just like facts and figures. So the more you can make it personal, the better. And then the next thing is to pick your targets because you don't, one thing I do know has having come from a newspaper background is back in the day, if somebody sent us some generic press release and they also sent it to our competitor, this is a pretty small county, so there are two newspapers, um, my mentors often just wouldn't publish it because they would have to take so much time to rewrite it so that it could be unique in our paper and not just be this generic press release. So really think about um, possibly if this is something important for you to get out, customizing it for some of the different targets that you want to send it to. And also the other thing, and, and again, these two talks are so kind of connected. The other thing is if you take the time to write good content, then you're saving them so much trouble, it's so much more likely to get published versus just slapping something together and then hoping they'll fix it. So different publications care about different things again, um, but if, if you're pastoring them all the time and you're not paying attention to what they do and don't publish when you send it to them, obviously they're gonna start kind of ignoring you or, or overlooking something that might be actually very important for you. So something else to keep in mind. And I just mentioned this a second ago, but the, the easier you can make their job, the more likely it is that it's going to get printed. And the more interesting the story is, the more likely it is to get printed. If you can make them want to read it, 
they're going to want to publish it, right? So that's just the point of this slide. I won't read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this goes without saying, but I'm surprised how often I still run into this, is that you must use correct spelling, grammar, and style. And, um, you know, the odds that, like if a newspaper sees something with obvious grammar or spelling mistakes, it just gets thrown away. Like they are very, just very impatient with things like that. And they look at it directly as a reflection of credibility. So there's some really great case, uh, really great tools out there like Grammarly. You can go to Grammarly.com. It's free and you can use this uh, grammar plugin. And it does a great job. It detects passive voice. It can figure, you know, suggest um, better comma placement, all kinds of very common errors can get caught and fixed. And I don't know where I would be without Grammarly. It's so, so helpful to me, um, even in just composing emails or getting uh, any kind of information out there. It plugs into uh, most programs on the computer, including Word and Google Drive, Google Docs. Um, very, very helpful. And the other thing we, we noticed too is that people um, start yelling. And what I mean by yelling is writing in all uppercase. Don't ever shout in all uppercase. It just stresses people out. <laughs> we, we'll read that and say, why are you yelling at me? Um, it can really feel aggressive. So um, some folks have a habit of doing that. It, I just say, don't do that. <laughs> don't compose in all uppercase. We, we had a customer who for years would email us in all caps. And we would get these messages that just sounded so frantic. And so God love him. He's a wonderful man. His name's Norm. So it was always Norm. Even when you said his name, you had to go in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So opinion articles or, um, gosh, there's so much more about this in the storytelling talk and lots of great examples of different ways to write the same statement or the same like story and lead in in different methods. So um, I hesitate to go into it too much in, in both talks. But there's lots of different ways you can get creative with opinion articles. And all of the examples for this are in the other talk, but you know, it could be just a statement of fact. Um, it could be a little mini story, quotes, um, actual like facts and figures. You could start with a question that makes somebody want to read on to find the answer. And of course, humor is always a great idea. Um, everybody could use more humor in their lives. And um, you know, some of the places that you can go to find some information on this, there are some really, really great resources on writing, tons of great resources on writing. So if we want to recap, I would say the best recap is the next slide. So reminding you why this matters. I just love this guy. I'm sorry. I don't know why he's so cranky. Um, but trying to just remember that telling your story and getting it out there without spending a whole bunch of money is actually a big deal. And we're happy to support you in it. Um, there's lots of different things you can do. We haven't covered every single option for guerrilla marketing today, but hopefully it's enough to really get you inspired to go work on some of your own marketing projects to get the word out about your district. Mm -hmm. And here are some uh, resources. So on the Streamline blog, we have so much good information, um, things that you can take and try, some checklists, some guidelines, uh, a lot of helpful information. And we also have uh, live webinars. So if you ever want to join those, you can join Sloan or myself or some of our other great presenters on topics of interest. Yeah. And and honestly, the blog is a great spot because we um, have done so much content recently around remote meetings. Um, we've got a blog post on how to hold, how to recite the Pledge of Allegiance while you're in a remote meeting without sounding like a cacophony of just awful noise, right? Because that's a really important part of many districts' meetings. Um, there's a ton of content around disaster planning um, I don't know what it's like right now in Colorado. I hope you aren't having the kind of fire season that we're having this year. There are a ton of active fires here right now. Um, so uh, disaster planning is a huge topic and there's a lot of information on that in our blog. The other thing I wanted to mention is that resources around guerrilla marketing in particular 
we've got a ton of them and they're not all in the blog. They're here and there and everywhere, but we've given so many talks on this and we have so many great resources if you want to learn more about it. To do that, just email info at getstreamline.com. I'll be happy to follow up and share anything that we have with you, answer questions, all of that. I think one of the last things I'll say is that we do have a virtual exhibit booth, which is interesting. It's got two people in it that don't look at all like Mac or myself, <laughs> but, but my You're avatar really is very like slender, <laughs> very slender, <laughs> dressed better than I typically am dressed. Um, but over there, you can learn more about us in particular. If you're interested in learning about what Streamline does, the tools that we build, why we love special districts so much, all of that can be found over in our virtual exhibit booth. So I hope you'll stop by. Yeah, and we can't wait to come back. Uh, we were with you last year in Keystone, Colorado, and you know, Ann Terry throws amazing events. So we're <laughs> always down to come out uh, to Colorado and uh, we'd love to see you again, hopefully in person. And please, um, from Sloan, myself, and the rest of the team at Streamline, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, yeah. hopefully we'll see you virtually in our next talk. Friday morning. Friday morning. All right. <laughs> See you all then. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Bye. Whew.